What The Faux Travel podcast. This is the fourth mini episode of series three, and this one is about saying yes more. Hello, welcome along, guys. So say yes more. What does that mean? Well, of course, we're going to get into it in the episode, but it just means taking opportunities. Of course, saying yes to everything is stupid. So we're going to be talking about taking opportunities in life because you never know where things will lead. Now, this guy coming up who we're going to introduce you to, very interesting guy. He's the perfect example of what can happen when you say yes more. We'll be talking to a guy called Dave Cornthwaite. So we'll introduce you to him properly a little bit later. But first, uh, to do this episode, we made our way to Poolbra, which is in England, and it didn't really go as smoothly as we thought. You will arrive at your destination on the left after 150 yards. It says it's on the left, though, and you're going right. It's <laughs> that done, though, isn't it? Oh. Should well, we just drive around and look for a big red bus? Yeah, exactly. Blue. I assume it's red. Blue. It's oh, it's blue. blue. Oh, I think yeah, it's blue. blue. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's the one that was on the website. Uh, we're around here somewhere. Are we lost? Yes. Yes. We are. <laughs> it's the best way to be. Just so, this is where we just were. <laughs> yeah, we've just done the other. I mean, we're free travellers, we should be able to get Brinsby through this. Travelers. So, we go to the back of Brinsby. Yeah, Travelers. so go by those white well, vans. We were so close to it. So, we're now at the second car park. What does it say to do? Do we park here, then walk the rest uh, of the way? Well, the instructions stop, so... <laughs> there are no more instructions. Cool. I think we do have to leave the car here. Should we find it and come back for our stuff? Yeah, I was about to say to you. Yay, we're here! We found it Shall and we there's no one here. Should we just in the corner here? Like, yeah. Or ask him and see what they say. Yeah. See if we can. If it's... Yeah, just, oh no, there's people on the bus. Great. <laughs> Is that them? I Is think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, well, it's good Hello. to see you again. How are you doing? Good, you? <laughs> yeah, very good. Hi, I'm Charlie. 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 Yeah, should we do a bit of filming? <laughs> awesome. How are you doing? Yeah, did you very find good. It okay? We did, yeah. <laughs> Just about, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, did. we found it. Okay. We've been on a little hunt, but it's fine. So, after all that drama, we found it. It was actually quite hard to find. So, I should explain. We're in the middle of a field, and this interview took place on a big blue double-decker bus called the Yes Bus. Okay, now this is something that Dave will tell us about a little bit later, but it's amazing. He's converted this double-decker bus into essentially a place to hang out. It's also a workspace because Dave throws lots of group events for a tribe that he heads up called the Yes Tribe. Again, we'll be talking about that later. So this bus was amazing. He gave us a tour around and then we got set up upstairs ready for the interview. Now, something that I should explain at this point is we've always had a little bit of trouble with Dave's surname, uh, which is Cornthwaite. Uh, A little bit of an unusual one, but I mean, it's not that hard, but we seem to find it really difficult. So just kind of around the house, me and Nick, if we ever talk about this interview, we we kept calling him Cornflakes. And um, I don't think that was the first time he'd heard it. So confession with your name. At home, we because uh, we d- we weren't sure. They're cornflakes. Yes. <sighs> How did you know this? I don't know. That was just a guess. You're not I supposed to cold, tell him that. Anyway. It's all right. I get it. You should see. You should see what the bank calls us. <laughs> Every letter is a different spelling. I've had corn thwacker. Okay. Cornflakes all the time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Love it. It's a good name. It's a good talking point. Welcome to another episode of What The Faux Travel Podcast. You're here with Nick and Amy as usual, but we are here with Dane... I'm so scared about your surname. I've just called you Dave. Dave wrong. That's awesome. Dave Cornthwaite. Is that correct? Yeah, you've got Cornthwaite correct, but you can call me Dane anytime. (laughs) Dave is a man who has dedicated a life to the things that happen when you say yes more. Move aside, Jim Carrey. We have the real yes man with us, Dave Cornthwaite. So how are you doing? You right? I'm loving that you just shifted Jim Carrey aside. I can totally take that. You Uh, you guys are welcome. (laughs) I'm guessing you get that a lot. Uh, Now and then, yeah. But in England, it's Danny Wallace who wrote the book originally, uh, the yes man book. And then Jim Carrey took over from Danny. Cool. So I just want to explain where we are. So we're in a big blue double-decker bus. Where did you buy this bus from and and how did you kit it out? (laughs) 
when the Yes Tribe uh, began, we I started to think, oh, how cool it would be to have a countryside base. You know, getting outside and away from social media and all the stress of the city was at the heart of that. So uh, one of the guys who came along to one of the first campouts, his name was Chris, and he happens to be an engineer. And three months later, Chris and I bought a bus together. Chris Great. led the, for 18 months, he led the conversion, super clever. And as you can see, it's, it's just an amazing space now. And together we've been kind of developing this space with help of Ems, my fiance, and a whole bunch of other people from the Say Yes More team. It looks amazing. So on the inside, um, so we've got a wooden floor. So we're at the top at the moment, wooden floor, wooden tables, which kind of come out, don't they? No, yeah, fold out wooden tables. Fold out, that's it. <laughs> fold out wooden tables. Um, there's those say yes more cubes and seats for the floor. There's hammocks. Um, and when you first walk into the bus, there's fake grass, which looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. So the, the front cabin's all clad in artificial grass and we've got a full on kitchen and full, full Wi-Fi. It's an off grid space as well. So totally solar powered. Uh, but it's the type of space you walk in and you think, wow, this doesn't even feel like a bus anymore. But it's a very familiar shape from the outside. Obviously cinema upstairs and, and all of that stuff. And the space outside is, is just as important. We've got hammocks all over the place, big yeah. fire pit, camping ground. And yeah, we just invite people to come out here and, and spend a bit of time. Just It's a great place to think of new ideas, conjure up adventures and yeah. just get away from it all. Looks amazing and a perfect place for us to do our interview today. So within this episode, we are, you don't know this, but we're going to play the Capitals game. Oh. So I hope you're good at your capital cities. Um, and we're going to ask you a couple of questions about, because you've got a very interesting life. You've done a lot already and you're still very young. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to hear that as every year rolls by. <laughs> um, and we're also going to, well, we're playing two games today, actually. We're also going to play uh, the yes, no game, which Nick has set up because uh, the whole theme of this episode is about saying yes more. Love it. Sounds awesome. Okay, so uh, should we kick off with the Capitals game first? So we'll get you warmed up, Dave, in the usual what the foe fashion with the Capitals game. For people that haven't heard this before, it's very simple. You will have 30 seconds. Amy will read you a country and you have to tell us the capital city. Okay, and you are allowed to pass if you don't know the answer. Okay, what's the average score? I would say the average score is about five or six. Okay. So the worst has been one. The best score, though, is Richard, who holds the record for 13, right. which in 30 seconds, it might not sound like a big That's number, good. but believe me, that is tough. For me, that all comes down to the speed of Amy's questioning. That's true. Oh, that, that's, a big, that's a big part of it. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Dave or Jane. Are you ready? <laughs> ready. <laughs> okay. And go. Australia. Canberra. Finland. Helsinki. Belarus. No idea. Pass. Nepal. Uh, Kathmandu. Germany. Berlin. Bonn. Bonn. Mexico. Uh, Mexico City. Cuba. Havana. Canada. Quebec. No. Carry on. Pass. Italy. Oh, that's embarrassing. Rome. Uh, Ukraine. Uh, Kiev. Malaysia. Time's up. Time. Yeah, that's trickier than is when the pressure is on. Yes. All right, I'm embarrassed. No, I think you did all right. Nick, do you want to give the scores? Okay, yeah, so we'll go through the answers. So Australia, correct, Canberra. Finland, Helsinki, correct. Belarus, or Belarus, as Amy said. Maybe it's, it's my handwriting. <laughs> 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 Belarus is Belarus. Minsk. I always say of Belarus, course. is that not right? I don't know, but uh, Belarus, so Minsk, that is a tough one. Nepal, Kathmandu, you got that right. Germany, Berlin, you got that right. You then said something else, but I've given you the point because you got it right. Didn't it used to be Bonn? Or is that East Germany? I've never heard of Bonn. And Mexico, <laughs> Mexico City, you got that correct. Cuba, Havana, you got that correct. Canada, it is surprisingly a tough one. It's Ottawa. Of course it's Ottawa. Italy is Rome, you got that correct. Ukraine, Kiev, you got that correct. And then we were out of time. So that means you got eight, which <gasps> is a very good score. That's but, what you wanted. Yeah. So, very maybe good. I, maybe I set my stall out by saying I want eight. I'm thinking non normally though, like you will probably have a maybe a bit of an unfair advantage in this game because you probably run or cycled or sailed <laughs> through through most of these cities. But, most. <laughs> but we'll get into that later. Right, so let's get into uh, the interview and then we'll have our second game later. All right. So let's go back to the beginning. Can you firstly tell me about your cat? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my cat was a gorgeous little tortoiseshell named Kiwa. Uh, I rescued her from drug dealers when they were really? out. Really? <laughs> yeah, she was uh, screaming in the yard of my 
then girlfriends, sisters, neighbours. Uh, if you can, if you can work that out. In Swansea, I was at university in Swansea, and then, uh, yeah, the cat was just obviously being abused for the first few weeks of its life. So we stole it, and uh, because it was super unhappy, and then it became a happy little adventure cat. And she woke up one. She she woke me up every morning just asking for breakfast. And on the morning of my twenty fifth birthday, I was kind of thinking a lot, complaintive. How, about, how am I 25 and my cat is way, way cooler than I am? <laughs> and then, yeah, and that and that kick-started a whole chain of events, which leads us to doing this podcast about a life of adventure on a bus. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so you were 25 years old and you had a bit of a realisation. I know you, you say it, you phrase it that yeah, your cat was happier than you, mm-hmm. but it got you thinking that things need to change in your life. So if you give us a bit more background, so in, like you said yourself, actually, in a video we've watched on paper, you were a successful, happy guy. You had a job, girlfriend, mm. house, cat. So yeah, why were you not satisfied? Why were you not happy? Well, I, th- I think we're all we're all taught what life is supposed to look like. You know, education has has to be some kind of line production scheme, I guess. And you know, getting a job and a house and settling down and not being in debt and all of that stuff is. Uh, I guess what you what you expect from adulthood when you're younger, but it's it's not really all it's cut out to be. Uh, I think all of the uh, a lot of the best things in life are, are things that we have to discover for ourselves by getting out of a box, by leaving the mainstream and the flow a little bit. And uh, I was miserable. I was I ended up doing a job, and because it paid, it covered my mortgage and it and it put food on the table and all of the stuff that we need. But I was I was miserable. Like I was just a depressed kid. That's not good enough. At the time, I didn't know any any better. I'd never met anybody who'd done anything different. And but the the idea of of travelling a little bit more, but just just waking up excited about life rather than dreading it, uh, it started to niggle niggle me after that first kind of realization. And I travelled a bit after school uh, and during uni holidays, but I completely forgot about it. I just forgot to to carry on living when I when I got that job offer. I, I'm I'm so so glad that I, that I decided to do something different. So, what was the first step to doing something different? How did you change your life? It was. It all comes back to this yes word, and and for me, it's so easy for especially like we live in the, I live in the middle of this this say yes more motto now, and I talk about it publicly, and I have a social enterprise called Say Yes More, and a yes bus, and a yes to and all of this stuff, and it's easy to forget what that means. But for me. Every time you say yes to something, you learn, you do something new. Sometimes the lesson is don't do this again. You know, you find out <laughs> yeah. that it's not good for you. But yeah. uh, there's no, uh, for me, there's no point in living unless we, we try as many things as possible. And through that process, we work out who we are, what we need. Uh, it leads to good relationships. It leads to good work choices on and on. So for me, it was, it was ad- adopting that motto, say yes more. Uh, and it, and that translated in a whole bunch of different ways back then. I, I just went to see friends more. Uh, I tried to fix the things that weren't working. So that, that didn't always work in the case of the relationship and the job. But ultimately, by saying yes a whole bunch, eventually I went snowboarding and after that took up a long skateboard and the rest is history. Yes, which we will be asking you about. Um, but in terms of how, so it was 25 when you kind of made this change mm. at age 25. So the years before that, how do you look at those? Do you kind of regret what you did or do you kind of see it in a positive way that it, you're glad that it happened that way because it's transformed your future life? No, I think uh, you can't You can't regret stuff like that. I, I didn't know any better. It wasn't like I had the chance to make a really a cool choice and then decided not to. I was just doing pretty much what everyone else was doing. I was travelling a little bit and backpacking around, but no real purpose to it. Uh, and then earning some money and then spending it all. That was, that was just life. So... I, I'm glad, I guess, I went through all of that because it, it led it led to what this is. I think when you're at a point where you're you can make a decision that you know is totally in line with your values as a human being, and then you decide not to because you're because you want to take the big pay packet, that's what you regret because you know better. So tell us what Expedition One Thousand is, and uh-huh. yeah, how it all started with this skateboard around Australia. Sure. So Expedition One Thousand. Uh, grew out of a couple of trips I did in those early post-cat conversation years. So my, my first uh, endurance trip, I'd never done anything like this before. I never really had any interest or even an inkling that a big endurance trip 
might might be important for me but taking up a long skateboard simply so I could improve my snowboarding skills set me off on a whole different track so I skated around for, for two weeks I'd never been on a board before even when I was a kid and I loved it it, transla- it transformed this town Swansea that I'd lived in for years into something completely new every little hill every smooth surface I I just completely dug it uh, because I was traveling around on a board and I just thought god if, if my whole mindset can change in a town that I know just with little journeys little micro trips then imagine if I if I travel a huge distance so then I started I started thinking about that process and two weeks after getting onto that board I quit my job and decided that I'd try and break the Guinness distance record on the skateboard so I I warmed up by going John O'Groats to Land's End and then crossed Australia from Perth to Brisbane all in all I was on that board for over half a year uh, in those two trips wow that was that was about four or five months after my birthday wake up with the cat. So I'd, right. I'd slowly been kind of stewing on ideas and realizing that I needed to do something different. And then I think all of that kind of came to the climax on the board. And, and that led to my first, I guess, adventure project. And that was the first journey of Expedition 1000, which now is, I guess, a guiding light for my, for my long distance trips now. Uh, And the idea is simple, it's to do 25 different journeys, each one a minimum 1,000 miles distance, but each one uses a different form of transport. So there's constant variety, you'll go to different places, each way of travelling is a different speed, a different psychological and physical workout. And it's all non-motor. All all without a motor, so that's, I guess there's three categories within that. One is human power, Uh, so you know, I'm pushing myself. Uh, One is natural power. And the other is animal power. So no motors, no fuel is the baseline. And can you give us a rundown of the the ones you've already done? Yeah. uh, So this is almost as as hard as the capitals test. So (laughs) I've completed 14 of those 25 so far. Skateboard, kayak, normal tandem bicycle, stand up paddleboard, sailboat, uh, a bike cart, kind of like a a four wheel bicycle. I swam a thousand miles down the Missouri River and the Liptigo, which is like a running running bike. Uh, across Europe and then number nine was a wike uh, which is a oh, recumbent tricycle with a sail across the Atacama Desert. Um, oh, see we saw a video of you earlier where you kind of I'd never seen it before it was maybe like an aqua the, skipper yeah is that yeah, what it like was? Like a bouncy water is, thing? Yes yeah you're no I haven't done it. a thousand miles on that yet okay but I do have a couple of records on that. Oh yeah. which are? Fastest 100 meters and longest distance without sinking. In the, is this like a Guinness world record? It's not Guinness, because okay. Guinness don't accept every kind of world first or record. Right. Um, but yeah, there's there's a community for all of these different forms of transport, and there's a human-powered vehicles community. So like, to have a record in that is way more important than, than, right, okay. than Guinness, who is <laughs> basically a business. Okay. Um, so gosh, yeah, no, so I'm not, I don't think there's going to be a thousand miles by Aquaskipper. No. I don't know what part of that body, what part of your body it would All of it. hurt the most. All of it. It's the best workout you can get. Yeah. yeah, you have to constantly pump this thing. And whoever's listening, like Google Aqua Skipper. Uh, and it's it's a joy to watch on YouTube. Uh, it's quite hard to learn. But when you get it, it's, it's super fun. I think when I saw it earlier, I would kind of describe it as the structure of a bike. Yeah. It kind of looks like a structure of a bike. You're holding on these two handles and yeah, you're just literally jumping up and down and creating waves, I guess. Yeah, for sure. It's got it's got two hydrofoil wings underneath it. So um, as, as you bounce, as long as you get the right w- rhythm, the, the hydrofoils keep you up and keep you moving. Uh, but you have to get the rhythm right. And the, uh, so it takes a, a little bit of, of time on it just to, just to get moving. But it's super fun. I love it. It looks it, yeah. So if I've got this right, at the time we're recording this, you've done 14 of yeah. these challenges so, and you want to do 25. Mm-hmm. The first one, like you said, was Skateboarding Australia, which is just mad because it's the biggest. It's just huge, Australia. Mm-hmm. It's flying flying one side to the other's five hours. So <laughs> skateboarding it, oh my God. And the, so the 14th one, the most recent one you've just done, that was Norway, wasn't it? Yeah, the... Most of the Norwegian coast, from Chirkenes in the north to Bergen in the southwest, on a on a Schiller bike, which is a, a pedal powered water bike. So, which one of these challenges so far has been the most challenging? I guess there, there's a few. I, I I'd say swimming, a thousand miles. Just it's it's a huge workout. You know, physically it's draining, but having I, I swam down the lower Missouri. I didn't swim before, so I, I learned how to swim properly during at the beginning of that trip. 
I was dragging a raft which weighed 30 odd kilos at uh, the time, which tends to slow you down as well. And then psychologically, head under the water for, for two months, you know, uh, as I was moving. That, that was tough too. It took me a while to sort myself out after that one. And what keeps you motivated? So you're, <laughs> you're in the water. So quite a popular swimming challenge is to swim the channel, isn't mm. it? And uh, one of my friends has actually done it. And I think it's all psychological. Like they say with every sport, running, a marathon or anything like that, it's all in your head. So what motivates you? So I guess swimming a channel is a is a good example. I I really love these long term challenges, and I I, I don't want to race against anything. Uh, I I like kind of totting up the numbers and covering covering miles ultimately, but that leads to the real richness, which is finding a random campsite at the end of each day. I always wake up on my trips not knowing where I'm going to be that night. So so every step, every discovery is is something that's lovely. I love setting up that temporary home on a sandbar, a riverbank, in a field somewhere, uh, and then waking up the next morning and starting starting that all over again. Uh, so I guess that's part of the motivation. I, I love meeting people and traveling slow in a weird way is a great icebreaker. It's a super way to start open up a relationship. And I found on these trips, I get to know people so, so fast. I often get taken into folks' homes and even have those little micro conversations in a gas station or just in, some, in the middle of some random desert, just meeting someone. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? But because you're doing something, because I've got this this focus of getting to a place and I guess, you know, I want people to, to make the most of their time here. It feels like really get some deep relationships fast. And I and I, I really dig that. So I think people listening will think, you know, this all sounds fantastic. I'd love to do these big adventures around the world. But people will be stuck in jobs like you were mm. and not particularly happy. So what could you say to people about really turning it into a lifestyle and almost turning it into a job? Like you, you do a lot of talks, don't you, about your adventures to inspire other people. So yeah. Yeah, what, what do you say to people who think, it sounds great, but you know, how, how can I do that and kind of make a career out of it? I think on a basic practical level, let's not focus on the, on the making a career. That's a, that's a big, long, daunting challenge on its, on its own. I think, first of all, I've, I've completed 14 of these trips and covered 22,000 miles under my own steam and visited 120 odd countries. But in these in these journeys, I've I've only been on the move for about 630 odd days. I'm almost 39, uh, so that's a tiny fraction of my life. So you don't have to give up your job to to live a positive, engaged lifestyle. You don't even have to do these big adventures. It's just a choice of how you carry yourself during a day. I would learned a lot about myself and I, I'd, I'd say I'm a completely different guy from that 25 year old because of my trips, because I've had a challenge, I'm really comfortable in my own company and space. And that's that's something that I think everybody should, should give themselves the, the privilege of having. You know, getting off into a remote desert and traveling by yourself does teach you a lot about what you're capable of. But it's definitely not the be all and end all. I'd say that, you know, just give yourself something to work on that you can't achieve tomorrow. You know, give yourself a long term project, whatever it might be, that takes you to a, a new level. You'll find that the journey is so rewarding. I'm sure you guys are on it too. You're, you know, you're making this podcast, you're already over the last couple of years, I'm sure you've met some amazing people and been to some cool places and things are happening that you had no idea would happen at the beginning. Yeah, like take today, for example. I mean, we've come to West Sussex. We're sitting in a double-decker bus that says Say Yes More on the side of it. And we wouldn't be here unless we were like on our journey with this podcast. For sure, yeah. Like you said, it's opened many doors for us. We've met some amazing people. And yeah, we're not doing it for the money. We're doing it for the love. Trust mm. me, we're not doing it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And, yeah. But it has to start that way. You know, maybe the financial reward comes later, but... Uh, if you, ch I think it's so important that we find something that we're we're happy to do for free uh, to volunteer our time towards. That's that's where the joy comes from. If you do something just for money uh, and you wouldn't do it for free, then at some point you're going to get tired of it and move on. And it's not it's lovely to to find a project like this that you, that you work on it takes you to places and you can't plan it either. You can plan the, the hell out of life if you want to, but life's not going to happen. Yeah, the the best things happen that are not really planned. You know, things that you wouldn't really predict. You know, I'm sure. A few years ago, you'd never really predicted where you're going to be right now, but it's happened and it's been a really cool journey. For sure. Yeah. So we are a travel podcast, so we're going to 
talk a little bit of travel now. So where would you say your favourite place or places are in the world? Yeah, to, just to, to be a tourist, to travel. I don't think I've ever been a tourist. I, I, don't, I don't really like going and seeing landmarks or places just for the sake of bringing a photo home. I, I can't answer where my favourite place is. My experiences over the last few years have completely depended on how, how I could get there. There's some random sandbars on the Mississippi River or the Murray River that I look back on really fondly and they were the best place I've ever been. And there's so many of those. I love Uganda as a country. It's so green, so hospitable. The people are just brilliant and really, really unique. Um, South America is, you know, this vibrant place full of music and it goes from desert to mountain to incredible coastline. And there's a there's hundred places there too. I also love the Nullarbor Plain in Australia. It's, you know, the first big kind of desert crossing I, I did on my, on my board. And, you know, there's nothing there. It's completely flat. Most Australians would say there's no point going there at all. But I loved it. I just love that feeling of riding a skateboard along those roads. Yeah, no, that's that sounds pretty good. So a bit of everything, really. And everything, every part of the world can offer you a different thing. And that's yeah. what you like. Okay, well, um, let's talk a bit more about your motto, say yes more. So I just want to explain that the first time we ever heard of you was at the Adventure Travel Show. Because we bought a ticket. And I think we'd just about started a podcast by that point. And uh, you were doing a, a talk there, and we sat down and watched you talk about Say Yes More, and not to blow your trumpet while you're in front of us, but it really inspired us, hence why we wanted to do this episode, because we just sat there and we was like, yes, like finally somebody's saying something that we've been trying to say all this time, you know, when you were talking about education earlier, so you kind of grow up and your parents and society tells you, you get married, you get a mortgage, you buy your house, you get a job, you go to university... And we just want to tell people, life doesn't have to be like that. And so while we was at this adventure show, so after your talk, we went up to your stand and we was talking to one of your friends and her name escapes me now. But I am friends with her on Facebook, so I should remember it. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, she was saying that you were just, I don't know whether you did it yourself as well, but they were doing a bike ride from London to Paris. Yeah. And it was happening like the following weekend. And they were like, come with us. And it was a really inclusive group and it was really nice. I really, really wanted to say yes to it. But I actually said no because I was busy the following weekend. <laughs> but uh, did you do that yourself? Did you do that bike ride? No, I didn't do that one. But I think that the beauty of this 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 community and this this yeah. attitude that's been born out of Say Yes More has it's just generated so many little trips like that, uh, yeah. and and big ones too, and and other random social projects and businesses and charities. But I think it might be Laura Kennington, maybe, or Sophie Radcliffe. It could be. No. It could be any number of people. Yeah. And oh, she writes a really. blog. She writes a blog. And she... That's freaking everyone these days. Yeah. Well, this is, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get her name later and I'll tell you. And also, I just wanted to say, uh, through your Say Yes More, so uh, my friend does parkour. And he was doing an event this week for to get more women into it. And he messaged me on Facebook and he was like, oh, Amy, I think this would be a bit of you. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought of Say Yes More and I thought we're interviewing him next weekend. So I'm going to say yes to this. <laughs> so I currently have uh, painful muscles because this week I've been running around Chelmsford, running up walls and stuff. But it was uh, great. Cool. You and did parkour it. Yeah, it was actually so much fun and I achieved a lot more than I thought I would. So um, I just want to say thank you. Oh, to you for that totally um, because you kind of inspired that in some way so some of the people we were talking about earlier this girl whose name escapes us <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah these, these people that we are talking about and this community that you mentioned, this community is called the Yes Tribe, mm -hmm. okay? And this is something that you, you started and you head up. So explain to us what the Yes Tribe is. So I guess a little bit of background. After, in 2015, I looked at my Facebook page and I had a few thousand people following my, my trips and the travel content I've been making. But I didn't really feel like I knew who they were. So I, I embarked on a little social project to turn them into real humans, I guess. And I love getting people outside. I think it's so, so important that we, we get a little bit of countryside time, especially if we live most of our life time in the cities. So I invited folks camping. Just come and meet me under, under the train station clock. And 19 people turned up at that London station that first night. It's pretty good. And we took a train out half an hour, got to know each other around a campfire. Everyone camped over and then got back to work the next morning. And it just felt like the right thing to do. So did it the next week and the next week and the next week and slowly those numbers kind of climbed at one point we had 55 people in a woodland in south london 
and and it, w- it was rad and slowly this these people started like forming their own little friendships and and it became a community of the type of people who'd say yeah i'm going to go and camp with strangers near london which is to isn't an idea that most people in the city would consider but because of that they were the type of folks you wanted around if you wanted to do something new if you wanted to set up a podcast or quit your job or leave your house or whatever it is something different a lot of people around around you would say why are you doing that they'd they'd question it but the folks in the yes tribe were like okay we get it we totally get it we'll support you you know i can design a website how can i help i know this person let's put you in touch on and on and on so the yes tribe i guess if it started there we had our first festival we call it yesterval uh, in October 2015, a few months later, and then slowly we were, we had over a thousand people on the Yes Tribe group, and and it grew and grew, and we started putting on more events and just sustaining this community. So I think that support network is just as important as as the message itself. And now we've got goodness knows thousands and thousands of people, an annual festival, weekly events. We've got a bus in the countryside, which is our I guess base camp. Uh, which is always open now. Again, one of those things you simply couldn't have planned. So if someone's listening, thinking, that sounds like a bit of me meeting a lot of strangers in, in the woods, uh, how do they How do they do that? So there's a Facebook page? Yeah, there's a, well, the, the website's got everything on it, sayyesmore.com. We've also got, you know, we're on Facebook and Instagram and all of that. There's the, the Yes Tribe group is on Facebook and that's a really nice, just head up there if you're looking for something new to do. People are always putting invites to go cycling for the weekend, other other bigger adventures uh there's there's things going on which people are, are kind of sharing and there's there's just a whole mix of, of stuff which will will get you inspired even if you don't come along to an event and through this you've also met your girlfriend yeah fiance oh fiance <gasps> she's Sorry, totally met that. my fiance so oh, right yeah, I was I was on one of my thousand mile trips uh, with a good friend Leon McCarran, who's an adventure filmmaker, and we were on what we thought would be a thousand mile walk around the Dead Sea in the Middle East, and we were there to kind of paint this picture of of the real Middle East, not the one that we see on the telly. Right. After three weeks, we'd walked through the West Bank in Palestine, having started in Jerusalem and then across the Jordan Valley, and I broke my foot in two places. I got two stress fractures, so I came home early three months completely clear in my in my diary which hadn't happened for a decade mm. and the first thing I, I did was go to a new year's party and Ems was there and we we just hit it off and and now we moved in not long after that we live on a boat in East London now and I decided that if you're if you're going to spend a lot of time with someone you need to know that you can you can work with them live with them and travel with them so okay, I asked whether true. she wanted to do one of these thousand mile trips with me so we got this random tandem bike and uh, which was voted for by my, my Facebook audience. Right, and okay. We, we rode it a thousand miles down the, the top half of the Danube, got to Budapest, and I proposed at the end of that. <gasps> oh my God, that's an epic proposal. Yeah, it was just lovely. Lovely little spot by the Danube. We'd, you know, we, it was on about 993 miles, so we figured we'd probably tick off journey number 13 of wow. that project. But uh, I love her. Uh, I think that for all of these, you know, finding work you love and, and finding your thing and being efficient and proactive and mindful and all of this, there's nothing more important than finding the, the person who supports you through everything. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Wow, oh, what a nice story. Okay, well, let's move on from a bit of chat and we're going to play the yes no game because, right. like I said, the whole theme of the episode is about saying yes. Um, but this time we don't want you to say yes because it's the yes no game. Oh, <laughs> so, Nick, what are your questions? So, I answer yes or no. Is that well, the game is you see, and um, unlike your usual fashion, you are not allowed to say yes or no. So I'll ask you a series of <coughs> questions, and yeah, you can say whatever you want. You can answer my questions, but you can't say yes or no, or like you can't say yeah or nah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> silly little game. One of the it's reasons. So ritual. This is going to be tough. Yeah, it's silly game, but it's tougher than you think. And uh, we thought we'd just give it a go and uh, and see how it sounds. So we're going to play the yes no game with the yes man himself. Are you ready? Maybe. <laughs> Very good. I tested this out on Amy this morning and she failed straight away. <laughs> I have just woken up, okay? Can I just say that? Cheating. <laughs> okay. What's your name? Dave. How did you get here today? I woke up. Was it an easy journey? Pretty easy. <laughs> have you ever been on a podcast before? Loads of times. Do you like podcasts? 
depends who the interviewers are. <laughs> do you like our podcast? <laughs> you guys are doing great. <laughs> what do you prefer, holiday or adventure? Adventure. Yeah, that's more fun, isn't it? It is very fun. <laughs> are you regretting playing this game? Try not to regret anything. <laughs> do you have a favourite country? I do not. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sorry now. Have you ever been to Brazil before? I haven't. Food's good though, have you heard? Food <laughs> tends to be pretty awesome everywhere. So are you a foodie in general? I like my food. Spicy food? <laughs> this is so hard to have Spice. any personality in this game. <laughs> if, yeah, if someone was, if this is like a live radio show and someone's just tuning in, I think this is the worst oh, interview yeah. I've ever heard in my life. And, um, is this a robot? <laughs> so um, do, do you like spicy food? Spicy food is nice. <laughs> and you've done it. You've aced it. I couldn't get a yes or a no. Well idea. done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I, I think it's a game over now, am I allowed to say? No, uh, you've done it, yeah. Game over. So, yeah, I mean, this say yes more thing, it's say yes more. It's not say yes to everything. Oh, that's true. Say yes to everything is ridiculous. That's really, really stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, during the game, though, I thought, I'd be, I'd be really cruel and say it. What's your motto? What's your motto? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is it? The, the what tribe? Um, but you've done it. Very, very good. You aced it. No problem. Yes. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much for letting us interview you in your big bus. Um, it's very impressive. And I now just want to live for the rest of my days in a bus. Isn't it cool? Mm, I love it. Yeah. Can I say for the listeners' benefits, you've got like hammocks here. You've got all electricity, Wi-Fi. Uh, it's amazing at this moment when we're recording this is when the world cup's going on as soon as we got here there was a game on the tv this place is incredible so i'd recommend people look it up we'll put some pictures on our social media and of course visit your website which was say yes more say yes more and if people want to hear about the bus we're the yes bus on facebook instagram and twitter it's not your average bus it's not just a bus we found and then put, put a tv in for sure, no, definitely. <laughs> and if someone wants to just look more into you, you have your own website as well, don't you? Yeah, DaveCornthwaite.com or DaneCornthwaite.com, <laughs> uh, if you fancy. Uh, if you can't spell Cornthwaite, then Dave Corn will, 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 will get you there Bring as well. Up. Yeah, a whole feast of projects and, and adventures and ideas, and there's a blog there to help anyone through kind of starting a career or just, just planning for a new adventure. You reminded me, what is your next adventure? Um, so my adventures this year have been have been more on the ground. We've uh, I'm running a couple of social projects. So the first is the Yes Bus. We've just opened so uh, regular workshops, uh, skill sessions, and just tribe days on here, so people can come and co-work. We've got another adventure on the way. This water bike that I took the Norwegian coast last year. Currently, it's on its way around the UK on a thousand mile journey. A different rider every single day. So if you're interested, you can sign up to ride your local canals. And we're picking up a million pieces of litter as we go and creating this plastic pollution wow. awareness booklet, which will go out to every school and country at the end. So I'm kind of marshalling that from afar. And then Ems and I are getting married in September and heading off on, we're creating a brand new travel platform, uh, travel for non-conventional people. So we're, we're going to start creating content around the world as part of our extended honeymoon, which will last forever. Never ending honeymoon sounds bloody great. So thanks so much, Dave, for joining us. That is the end of this mini episode. Our next main episode out on the 1st of August will be about Oslo. We will see you guys then. See ya. Don't want to be ya. Please feel free to get in touch with the show. You can do that by checking out our website, www.whatthefoetravelpodcast.com. From that, you can find all of our social media channels. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our email address is whatthefoepodcast at gmail.com. <laughs>